know that God's truth is marching on as we see uh, what has happened in the past as we prepare for the future. What do you say? Amen. Our mission story this morning, our mission story this morning is uh, entitled Pastor or Politician? Pastor or Politician? Our mission story for February. 25th, 2023. It goes on. Jacob first felt that God was calling him to become a pastor when he was a seven year old boy in Tanzania. But, but as a teen, he found himself at, at the crossroads of either becoming a pastor or a politician. It seemed that becoming a politician was the easier path. So he put God to the test. Jacob faced intense pressure to enter politics. Several politicians urged him to join them in their work. Their overtures were very powerful. He said Jacob exhibited the essential characteristics for becoming a politician and promised him that the work would be easy and the pay would be hard. Now their offers clashed with Jacob's childhood desire to become a pastor. Complicating matters, he couldn't seem to find the money to pursue theology studies in the University of Arusha, the only Seventh-day Adventist university that offers pastoral training in Tanzania. He needed a substantial amount of money to cover tuition fees, accommodation, and food. Jacob had no hope of qualifying for government financial aid or a scholarship. Jacob decided to test for it. He had been faithful in returning tithe and offering, and resolved to claim the promise of Malachi 3.10. It says, bring all the tithes into the storehouse, that there may be food in my house, and try me now in this, says the Lord of hosts, if I will not open for you the windows of heaven, and pour out for you such blessing that there will not be room enough to receive it. So Jacob prayed, my dear Lord, I will wait for a call of either becoming a politician or to join your work, I will accept whichever comes first. But to him, the chances of being called to work as a politician seem far higher than that of being called to become a pastor. Shortly after the prayer, Jacob received a phone call from a distinct, from a district pastor who invited him to preach at one of his churches the following Sabbath. Jacob accepted the invitation. After preaching that Sabbath, he was moved to hear the church members, including the pastor, praise God for his sermon. Jacob began to preach regularly at various churches. Then he was invited to work as an associate chaplain at an elementary school. After some time, Jacob felt impressed to step aside from his work as an associate chaplain and establish a media and IT company. Uh, he prayed to God to use the company to provide the money to enroll at the University of Arusha. He prayed that God would provide enough money that he wouldn't have to ask church members to go home. And God is faithful. Well, I see that you are calling me. As he prayed, he says, I see that you are calling me. Please give me the assurance of being able to pay tuition and accommodation fees at the university. Soon the media and IT company began to generate enough funds to cover most of the university's monthly expenses. Several friends living abroad unexpectedly offered to contribute money as well. Jacob wondered whether the time had come to enroll at the university. Then he was called to serve as the associate pastor of a church near the university campus. He got record. It was an unusual call because in Tanzania, such calls usually are reserved for theology graduates. Uh, he hadn't even started yet, but yet he was called. So Jacob accept, accepted the call and enrolled at the university. Today, Jacob is wrapping up his studies at the university. His preaching already has had an impact on young people. 
a series of sermons that he prepared on practical faith was well received, and he is developing them into a book. As he looks back, he has no doubt that God called him to gospel ministry at the age of seven. The, speed, the series of miracles that have happened to me prove that God called me when I was young, he says. This testifies to the fact that God calls people from childhood, even now, as he did in ancient times. God is faithful. Yeah. And he uses us according to his will. This quarter, 13 separate, seventh offering, will help expand the University of Oregon with the construction of a multi purpose hall, part of which will house the theology department and classroom for ministerial. Thank you for planning a generous 13th Sabbath offering to help students like Jacob answer God's call to ministry. You cannot hold trouble to pension more. But our money is can. All right? You can help those that are in need for God's work. So let us be faithful as uh, our 17th, 13th Sabbath offering will be lifted last summer. All right? So now, given our, our, our brother, plenty of time for his presentation, so that um, as we welcome her, give our presentation to history. Okay? Well, the Butterfield will come up now. How are we doing? Oh, all right. <clears throat> okay, I have been wanted to do this in any event. So I was asked if I could do a bit of a recap of where we were and then where we got to. And I have a little bit of a where we might go to. Um, but before I do all of that, I just want to take the opportunity to introduce Stacey Lee Williams. She's the executive director of Curb Citizens Uprooting Racism in Bermuda. And right here, surprising actually, Bill and I, is Cordell Riley, former president of CURB and current member of the Central Council of CURB. So I'm very grateful to see Cordell today. So um, if we do a bit of a recap, it was a blend of sort of Bermuda's history and just how we got here. So I won't go too quickly, but I also won't spend a whole lot of time. So about, is it, we're looking good back here? All right. So about 33 million years ago, there were four different volcanic eruptions, okay, I would say in about 10 million years ago was the real eruption. But what's important here is that <clears throat> the volcanoes that created Bermuda are unlike any other on the planet. And there's a lot of thought as to why that's the case. Some people think when there was one sort of one land mass and then you know, we broke off into continents, that Bermuda was a keyhole. And that that's the reason why it was different because that's where the rest of the continent split from. But in any event, we are unique. Secondly, when we have these calderas, uh, that's where the volcanoes get so big and so heavy that all that debris falls in and of itself. And we have two in Castle Harbor and Great Sound, so that's why the waters are so deep there. And one day, Bermuda, right? That's who discovered us between 1505 and 1507, was making its way from the West Indies to Europe, saw Bermuda, and one uh, well, Spanish king, I guess, gave it uh, the name after one. And here, uh, it's the first time we were ever placed on a map we're in the top right corner there. Uh, I used to joke that we were upside down on the map because you see it says La Bermuda until one class of very distinguished gentleman said, Mr. Butterfield, you'll find if you lay that map on a table, and you're on the other side of the table, it's upright to you. And he said, it's probably a ship's map. And I said, yeah, yeah, good one. All right. So then we spoke about uh, Spanish Portuguese rock. Mr. Riley and I are having a, a bit of a discussion about this, and we think 
one way, the government and others think another. But remember, uh, Portuguese rock, we used to call it Spanish rock because of the inscription there, 1543. And we then thought it was Portuguese rock because the top initials look like an R and a P for the king of Portugal. And then the Bermudan government and the Portuguese government had a ceremony and it's now Portuguese rock, they say, because Bermuda, and this is the story, the Spanish king gave Bermuda, or there was an agreement struck between uh, the Spanish king and a man named Fernando to be the governor of Bermuda. And Spain was going to be the colonizing power and Bermuda would have been given his independence after three years. And so that was 1527. Uh, and it said that in 1543, this inscription, so the actual R and the F is for Fernando, the actual Portuguese person who's going to be a governor. And that's why it's Portuguese rock. And so I have a bit of a challenge with that because if the Spanish was the, if you will, parent country and the governor happened to be Portuguese, is it the Bermuda Portuguese or Spanish, right? Because it's actually still Spanish. So anyway, the governor was Portuguese, the king was Spanish. And there you go. Now we know sort of what happened. The first Englishman to step foot in Bermuda was Henry May, and the first African or first black man was Venturia. That's not actually him. We don't know. But uh, we do have a ferry named after him. And if you remember, he was sent ashore to chop wood to make repairs on the ship because his captain, uh, Diego Ramirez, had been stuck on rocks. And so the crew sent him ashore. He was the enslaved crew. And look, we need you to chop some wood. He went, and they heard all this crazy noise. The hogs were grunting and the cahals were out screeching and so uh, he was screaming and they came out and rescued Venturia and then uh, went back, repaired the ship and sailed off. So Venturia we recognize at least by the ferry. And then we came to 1609 and, and Sea Venture and there's Thomas Gates on your left and George Summers on your right. And so they wrecked in Bermuda in 1609 just outside of Fort St. Catherine. But 150 people on board the Sea Venture and every single one survived. If you recall, the reason there were these nine ships going to Virginia from England was that so these nine ships were heading to Virginia because the Virginia settlement had kind of failed, right? The English had gone over. To, maybe I'll speak quicker and that'll do. The English had gone to Virginia and it was failing, and so here was this another push. And what happened was Catholicism was throughout the Americas, right? The Catholics were everywhere due to the Spanish and the Dutch. And so the English wanted the Anglican church in the hemisphere. And so they said, you know what? We're going to get some too. And so nine ships uh, head out, but storm, scatter, sunk. Sea Venture makes it to Bermuda. But then in 1612, um, the plow happens. And this is the first time people actually set out to live in Bermuda. And so when we talk about when was Bermuda settled or colonized, this will really be the time, 1612, and the plow, and Bermuda's first governor, Richard Moore. Um, one of the things we want to put a pin in at the moment is that Moore didn't plant crops. It's about forts protecting Bermuda from the Spanish. And so that's really the early days of how we went out. And that failure to plant crops still impacts us today. We do not feed ourselves, right? We import back. 1800s, governors were saying, you all are going to starve out if you don't plant crops to feed yourself. You think your money is going to save you. And so now we're paying crazy amounts of money through inflation and shipping and oil because we just never made it a priority as a nation. So in 1684, we were a company asset all this time. And then I've actually read, and there's a book that's going to come out in the next Blue Flag class um, called The Failure of Early Bermuda. And it's all the mistakes that the Bermuda company made. I mean, they were pretty terrible business people. But in 1684, the Bermudians said, you know what? We can't live under this company rule anymore. It's killing us. Wrote to the king, and the king said yes. And that's when Bermuda became a colony of the United Kingdom, right, in 1684. And the quo part of a run, where our fates may lead. That's there from Virgil's play, the Ionid. And then as we talked about the crest, that's not actually the sea venture, as most people would assume it is, but it's the Edward Bonaventura. That is the ship that brought the first Englishmen to shore in Bermuda. And so remember the English and the Spanish, I was saying, kind of arguing who, well, they weren't. Everybody thought we were a Spanish uh, building. But then after this, the English said, no, look, here, we were here first, 1593. So that's why the uh, wreck there would be from 1593 rather than the 1609 and George Summers. And then we had this small debate 
about what Kassab and Farina. Uh, I think everybody was okay. And people were saying, well, no, 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 they're different. They're the wet, the dry, the mix. My mom prefers, I don't like Farina, I like Kassava. One plant, remember? And it was the root. So there's a the plant. You dry and out the root, you grind it, and then you make your pot. So then Gari in West Africa and Yucca in South America. And then we spoke about our national dish, codfish and potatoes, originally imported as food to enslave black Bermudians. But of course, we book it up, national dish now, and we do our thing. We then went on to the origins of fish chowder. And remember the brown and the red and the brown is supposed to be authentic. I was teaching this class very recently, and someone said, so Butterfield, you say the brown is authentic and the red is added tomato? I said, I didn't say that because I'm not going to cause that war. But recently, the person in the class sort of indicated to me that they were going to check out my information, which was fine. I, you know, I, I, I grew, I learned. So they called Harvey Vasco, uh, chef extraordinaire. And um, they played the call on the speaker. Harvey Vasco, current chef extraordinaire, said there's very, very, very little tomato in fish chowder. And he says, for instance, when I make a 10 gallon, 10 gallon, right, uh, fish chowder, he says two tins of tomato. So if you ever want to get down to it, even the professionals, right, barely any tomato. Okay, then we talked about Bermuda Day. We used to celebrate Empire Day. You celebrate England or Queen. And so after race riots in 1977, a pit commission was established to look into the causes of those race riots. And we realized, or one of the recommendations from Lord Pitt was, you all need to celebrate yourself. You've actually achieved a lot. And so from 1979 until now, you celebrate Bermuda Day. And then in 2017, the government changed it to rather than 24th of May, the last Friday in May, because of your children being so tired of school. OK, uh, now we celebrate Cop Match due to celebrate emancipation. So we emancipated uh, enslaved Bermudians or abolished slavery, depending on your outlook, on the 1st of August, 1834. And you recall on the long right-hand column is the Emancipation Proclamation. I read some of it out. And in the middle column, there were actually uh, auctions for human beings, slave auctions there, um, right in the middle. And so it was, you know, why did they, is that have to put them there? Why that? But it also is that you can see they were still selling enslaved Bermudians two weeks prior to emancipation. Then got the little story about Oboe's point and the role of how racism, culture, and sexism played out so that the Oboe doctor had three daughters. The daughters were going to lose his name once they got married. And so the Oboe name was given to an enslaved Bermudian that he had, one of his slaves. And so now all boys in Bermuda are black names, not white French names, because of that. Now, I can tell you, and those who do read on, you find that uh, those old boy daughters had a lot to do with Mary Prince. Uh, in fact, one of the daughters married a man who then, I don't use the phrase earn, but so I say slave holders, and so held Mary Prince as a slave. And this lady was the one who demanded her husband lock her up in a cage, beat her daily, treat her like a dog. These two, two of the three sisters feature heavily in Mary Prince's life. And as you can imagine, not greatly. And then we spoke about Gumbays. Uh, we know Gumbays from Angola. We have Angola a descendant uh, enslaved black Bermudians now. And we know Gumbay was a Bantu word, means rhythm. Um, it's also a type of drum, but it means rhythm. And here was a runaway, an ad uh, looking for runaway enslaved Bermudians. And the bottom paragraph, we read it at the time, quite heavy. But it was to show sort of what the feeling is about Gumbays. And that continued through 150 years, ads and comments like this in the Royal Gazette. And so people were saying, be proud of our Gumbays. They were not supposed to last, and, and here we are. Gibbet Island, very heinous bit of history, but this is where they hang. Remember, if you were unfortunate enough to be an enslaved black Bermudian and assaulted the slave holder, that's where you were taken live and then hang the gibbet. If you ever played hangman as a little child and you drew the hangman, you drew a gibbet. And then they would hang the person there alive. So it's not like, you know, when you see somebody is executed by hanging, you know, it's instant. No, this, you were just hanging. And it was a message to other black Bermudians who might dare step to or assault a slaveholder. So we were going along that path. We um, then spoke a bit about, I'll come back to that, Tucker's Town. 
and Dinah Smith and the uh, Rubber Tree and Cubs Hill Methodist Church. And I believe we arrived, which was when slaves arrived on a ship. I think we spoke about that. Um, look at the back page. Maybe, yeah, good. Thanks, Ms. Williams. Okay, we'll cover it. We'll stop. And then we talk about Reverend Stevenson and Blackburn. And never forget him, right? This is the fellow went around the yellow fever, taking all that stuff up. So we come very quickly to Joseph Rainey. Now, Joseph Rainey left South Carolina in around 1861, came with his wife um, to Bermuda, and he couldn't read or write when he arrived. His wife was a dressmaker, and that's an ad from the Royal Gazette, and they were living in St. George. <clears throat> On the right there is just the African Diaspora Heritage Trail marker for Joseph Rainey's, what we commemorated him for. So Rainey was here and living in St. George's, then St. George's had a yellow fever outbreak, so he left St. George's and went to Hamilton, he was a bartender for a bit, then went back to St. George's, and while he was in St. George's, the war in the U.S. ended, and so in 1866, he and his wife left Bermuda and went back to the U.S. Joseph Rainey is one of the very first black men, in fact, there's only two, elected to the U.S. House of Representatives when he returned. So a man who couldn't read or write went back, and he wasn't, the other man was actually appointed, right? Someone had died, and they said, you're the guy, and they made him. He actually ran and was elected. One of the interesting things, I read a book of his speeches, and it's in modern times, it's very, very difficult to read someone, a black man particularly, saying the Republican Party is a party of black men. You Democrats are so racist, you're going to keep black people down, you're going to, and you just think about the world today, but, you know, they say that's the party of Lincoln, um, and so Rainey and his wife, um, and so in St. George's, where he had his shop, we have Barber's Alley. So Barber's Alley in St. George's is named after Joseph Rainey. I think we spoke about the Roanoke. Yeah, this was the ship that left Cuba. No, thank you. That's a good place to start. So we're going to tell a quick story here, um, and then I'm going to do some. So we'll tell this quick story. So in Havana in 1864, I don't know, yeah, 1864, this ship, the Roanoke, was leaving Havana on its way to Manhattan, and on board was a man. Last name was Brain, and he had about eight brethren with him. And so they get a little bit outside Cuba, and they overpower the crew, shoot and kill one of the officers, and overpower the ship. They lock up all the passengers and rob them, and then rob the safe. And they sail the ship into just outside St. George's Harbor. Rain gets off the ship on a lifeboat and goes, comes to shore in St. George's and goes to the Globe Hotel. Remember, I'm saying the Globe Hotel was like the headquarters for the Confederacy. So he goes in, whatever he does, comes out early in the morning, and that ship then goes back out to sea. And what the plan is, is they're going to use this ship to attack the North. These are Southern Confederate guys that are going down to Cuba, got on this ship, and they're going to use this ship to attack the North. Sort of like the Trade Center attacks in 2001, right? They're using the plane to attack the capital. That was the plan. So they go out, and Brain had arranged for a second ship to come into the harbor on that second night to offload the passengers. So the second night, the Roanoke comes back, the second ship shows up, and they offload the passengers. Remember, they've got to use the ship for war, and that ship takes the passengers to Newfoundland. Imagine you get on a ship in Havana, thinking you're going to Manhattan, and it says you're taking to Newfoundland, Canada. But they had to do that because if they took them to Manhattan, then everybody would know what's going on. So the third, they go back out to sea, and then on the third night, they do to come in, and there's another ship that's supposed to come, and it's going to offload coal onto the Roanoke, so they can then steam to the north, and go hammer the north. That third night, that ship shows up, but the waves are too choppy. It's too strong, and so they can't transfer the coal from one ship to the Roanoke, and they can't figure out what to do. So they decide just going to scuttle the Roanoke, which means it's going to sink it, maybe set it on fire and just sink it, which is this depiction here of the Roanoke. So <clears throat> Brain and the one black Bermudian captain are walking around the road and they'll see if they can salvage anything that's left on the ship. Because all of these ships have black Bermudian captains to get out of the harbor and through the reef. So the story is that the black captain found a rifle and was walking around the ship just looking for things. And then as he was walking around, he looked into a room and saw someone. And that person looked threatening. So he raised the rifle and shot at the person. And it turns out he shattered a mirror because it was actually just a reflection of him. So they then lit the ship on fire. And it's going down to this day, and I mean 
this day as we're standing here right now, or you're sitting, we don't know where this is. We have no clue where the Roanoke is. And the interesting thing about this is that what I've just told you, most of the people who study Bermuda's offshore don't know what you know. Because the story that they're told about finding it is we don't understand it because it went down under the steam of a black Bermudian pilot, and that should have never happened. These black Bermudian pilots were ideal, they were perfect. So how did they make such a mistake that the Roanoke has sunk? It wasn't a mistake, right? It was a plan. But I can tell you, even amongst the dive shops, you can check in the newspapers, we don't know where the Roanoke is. And so uh, that's sort of the last of the story. I did want to show you this just as a recap and a resource. So if you really do want to read about some of this stuff, The Many-Headed Hydra is a book, fairly thick, um, about the fight against slavery throughout the United Kingdom. That's not really why I have the book here. Um, chapter one of this book speaks about an issue that they say started off sort of the world being focused on money and people traveling for money and, and moving people around for money and commerce. And they say that this first thing happened in chapter one of this book. And chapter one in this book is called The Wreck of the Sea Venture. That's how important. Now, I'm going to read you just the two things. I'm not oh, wait, oh, wow, it's clearer than this. So you might be able to see it. So at the top, they talk about Bermuda and say military men, talking about Summers and Gates. Military men transformed Bermuda and Virginia from places of liberty and the fullness of sensuality. Now that meant the beauty that they saw. If you see these early writers about the foliage and the weather and the water and the, even the colors of the birds and the fish. So to places of bondage, war, scarcity, and famine. That's what being military is that they, they organized everybody into companies of men and they were concerned about the English in England as opposed to us living here and then building a comfortable life for Bermudians here, which is really what the first sentence says. By 1613, the colonists were starving to death. Right? Remember I said Richard Moore, forts, not crops, were starving to death as their bodies bent and blue, spent their vital forces laboring on forts that would make the island a strategic military outpost in the early phase of English colonization. That's what the emphasis was in the beginning. If you come down, the wreck of the sea venture and the drama of rebellion that played out amongst the shipwreck suggest the major themes of Atlantic history. These events do not make for a story of English maritime greatness and glory. Right, so I'm reading quickly, but just think about it. Not about greatness and glory, nor for a tale of heroic struggle for religious freedom. Though sailors and radicals both had essential role. This is rather a story about the origins of capitalism and colonialism, about world trade and the building of empires. It is also necessarily a story about the uprooting and movement of people. The making and transatlantic deployment of hands is a story about exploitation and resistance to exploitation, about how the sap of bodies would be spent. It is a story about cooperation amongst different kinds of people for contrasting purposes of profit and survival. It is a story about alternative ways of living and about the official use of violence and terror to deter or destroy them, to overcome our attachments to liberty and the fullness of sensuality. That's what they said the English did to Bermuda. What we could have been had it been for everybody, had it been a paradise for all. Now, I just want to, I'm going to pause on this one and just take it through a path. So, Let's go right to the beginning. We started with volcanoes, and then the English came, the Spanish wreck, and then George Summers. Then George Summers' story goes back to England, and that goes like wildfire. In 1612, the plow comes, and people come to live. Richard Moore, first governor. But because they were stealing from the Spanish, right? They build forts, not crops. A year later, the Bermudians are starving, but the forts are straight. 1614, one of those forts deters a Spanish Think attack, early days. So 1684, the next real change to Bermudians' life. We become a colony of the United Kingdom rather than an asset of a company. Things stay. Slavery is there. So what do we hope for? Emancipation, right? Great. Emancipation comes. Everybody is no longer, well, let's say everybody is free. That's the theory. But of course, successive governments over the next century and a half passed a ton of laws 
that will either send people into some sort of servitude or slavery or apply strictly to black people. When I once tried to figure out how we got here, what did I think was the, sort of the worst law that was passed that impacted or showed the difference between black and white, even though they were both free and both per medium? It was a law that was passed that if a black man was walking down the street and a white man was walking towards him, if that black man didn't stop, move out of the way and bow, as that white man walked by, the white man could kill him on the spot, no type of repercussion. Now, when you talk about life versus respect and made up, trumped up respect just to instill racism and oppression, what are we looking for, right? So we come now to something like emancipation 1834. Doesn't really make a difference. I'm going to show you this slide from 1860, and I'm going to Break down what this man is saying. Now, this is a man, Godet, and this is Godet the Young. He was a slaveholder. Let me be clear. But this is what he's saying. He's talking about us. Okay? He's talking about us. So slow is the march of opinion in Bermuda that the political constitution that pleased the islands two centuries ago. Now, what I'm saying, this is 1860. He's talking about the arrangements of 1684. And Bermudians didn't complain then. He says, as regards the mass of people, us, there's yet no dawn of that crisis. So we've not met a crisis where we've said this system doesn't work for us. We haven't. This was 1860. Have we done so, so far? Which must, so, the man, there's yet no dawn of that crisis which must ever arrive. So in other words, it always happens where people's intellect advances greater than the institutions of the country. We keep bowing to the institutions of the country. Okay, I'm not going to get too deep here, but I just want to put some of this history because the canal is right here, and thank goodness he's sitting right here. Because if he was back there, I might have been a little loose. So what did we do? All right, so we get a constitution in 1968. And we think, yes, now, you know, it's got to work. But no, because we need Dr. Paulu, Roosevelt Brown. He comes to fight for everybody at the right to vote. Why wasn't it just straightforward? Emancipation, everybody votes. And so he comes and he fights for universal adult suffrage. And he says this, in order to truly have something, give it away. If it works for someone else, then you know it has value. Right. So we have a constitution in 68, and um, we're going to go for that. Um, that doesn't work, though. And so we need a Human Rights Act in 1981. Really? Human Rights Act, because we can't treat each other right when we're giving each other constitutional rights? Well, all right, all right, all right, okay, we get it, all right. The Constitution was just, you know, the right to life and liberty, and we can all associate with each other how we want. But yeah, Human Rights Act, right, I got rights now, I'm a human, and you can't say and do these things to me, and you're going to treat me equal, right? And so Bermuda should celebrate equality, because we have a Human Rights Act. We need, sorry, a little far, a Cure Act, if you remember this, 1984. Okay, and the government brought out something, 1994, that says companies have to state how many black people they hire, and when, and how, and at what salary level. And let me just say this here, without any fear of, well, just without any fear of fear. This was the UBP. The PLP didn't come in until 98. That Human Rights Act, that's the UBP. No, there were also the 40 thieves and the oligarchy and the government, but I just want you to look at 25 to 11, 30 to 6, in terms of the results in Parliament, 25 to 11, 30 to 6. Now, what you see, what the UBP was doing. But again, the cure, that didn't work. And so what had to happen four years later? Curb. Okay? And then Curb says, you know what? We just need to show people. If people knew better, they do better. We just need to show them. Let's just show them that this is wrong and unjust and unequal, and it's causing the country to hold on. And so curb, black people, white people, foreigners, Bermudians, get together and try to do their thing to uproot racism in this country. And you know what? We go, nice curb, good work. But you know, it's our culture. Nice work, curb, but I've got generational wealth. You don't want me to give the black person to you. Yeah, but curb keeps at it. Okay? So then, 1998, PLP comes in, and under some theories, in fact, I had some white folks tell me, well, the slaves are now in power. So in their mind, 98, definite equality, right? Like, I mean, what could you do? You, got, you guys can write the laws you want now and fix all of their systemic problems. It 
well, by O3, this was equality, okay? because there was still this inequality. And so Dean Janaba says, by the next election, we're going to have one person, one vote, each vote will be equal. And so some of this stuff we don't even look at today now, you may see something in the news or in the newspaper or burn news that says, oh, the Constituency Boundary Commission has met and blah, blah, blah. That's not the details people generally look at. But in the context of our country and trying to keep equality in the political system, granted, the Westminster system itself is, needs to go. I, I, that's a whole different lecture. You're going back on that one. But at least what I'm showing today is that what we look for, we've had. We've had the legislation. We've had the practices. You've included the law. You've got rid of the government. The 40 thieves don't exist. Tucker's town definitely is now stands out. But if we let an airport, he said, St. Reed, where our country started, that beach now is got a hotel on it. If the union members can't decide what they want to do, because people who are non members can vote, these are things that happen right in front of our eyes in the last four years. We are building a Bermuda. Somebody, 20 years from now, is going to stand here and they're going to talk about the pandemic and how Bermudians came through. And what did it do with this small country? How did the government deal with it? Were people afraid? And were they so afraid they gave up this? And what future did they think? And how was the economy? How many jobs? And you know what? What's going to say? Having come through what they had, how did they get here and perform like this? Because we keep looking for that hero. We're looking for that other person. Guess what's happened today? You all now know what I know. So I'm not going to let you all. Don't let me all. Okay? Don't let me all. And let me put it to you. A lot of stuff that happens is based on, it's, it's based on internalized racism. Okay? So it's not that I just think that I am less than. I think you're less than them. And so how you get treated, you know what I say? But what do you expect is them. But what about a soul? Hmm? We have spirit. What do you expect? It's them. No, I don't allow myself to be treated like that. And if I'm not going to allow myself to be treated like that, I'm not going to allow you to be treated like that. And if you decide that you're going to demand more, and people won't treat you like that because of how you see yourself, and you won't treat the other person like that, that internalized stuff becomes internal pride. And then that line that we draw in the sand that says enough, or we're not doing that, or we're not having that, or I don't care, we're bringing a fairer income tax to deal with generational wealth. I don't care what you all say. I don't care if you think you're a labor government and this is a labor thing. We are the people, or voiceless, or whatever it is. This is our country. Don't let somebody, 10 years, 20 years from now, I don't be as good looking, I get it, but somebody's going to stand here before your descendants, your grandchildren, and say, guess what? This was the year between 2020 and 2030, and this happened. What's the story going to be? So um, I have one last little commercial for you. Um, I'm, I'm done on the presentations. Curb, or I think maybe we'd like to come up and, because um, the ED is going to come up and give, I'll get to one The ED is going to come up and just going to tell you a bit about some curb programming. That's coming, and then I will do a wrap up. I, maybe. Okay, thank you. And thank you. Mr. Bonavio, <laughs> for um, presenting to the SDA over these last, I think it's been three Saturdays, it was a little uh, break in, in there. Um, we are very honored to have been invited and, and grateful for that. Um, I just want to share where you can find her. Um, we do have a website. That's www.uprootingracism.being. We also offer courses that where you can get a lot more information about the history of racism in Bermuda, um, the history or critical conversations on race, or even implicit bias and, and things like that. And we also hold the Truth and Reconciliation Community Conversations. I'm not sure if any of you have um, attended this, but they are free to attend. It's a seven week series. Our next series starts on March the 15th um, for seven weeks on Wednesday evenings 
for about two and a half hours. And Mr. Riley here, he facilitates that. I also facilitate, I'm a lead facilitator in those conversations. And we have some other members that do it as well. But the, the goal of that is to um, get deeper and have the conversations, learn more about Bermuda's history, and then all of us come together with some solutions of the way forward. And so that is a mixture of black and white people coming together to have these conversations. And they have been trans transformational. We've had about close to 2,000 people go through that program so far. We started it in 2017. We, yes. It starts at 6 in the evening. Um, and um, the sessions that are coming up is going to be in the Global House in the Mirrors, tra Mirrors Training Room. All right, but you do have to register or give me a call in the office and I will make sure um, you get signed up. Um, and if you want to take down the number 707-1496, 707-1496. But again, we're very grateful um, to have been here today. I know you might have a couple of questions for Mr. Butterfield, um, but thank you. Okay, so I, I must say I have limited, right? We had 20 minute bunches, but if there are any questions, I don't know what else for the moment. Yeah, sure. Yeah. Uh, it was written, definitely. So the Maria Celestia was a ship that went down that found wine and, per and perfume in there. That was contraband. Um, but we found it was a regular steamer that came to me. But it was a blockade runner, so it was fast. But also smugglers. So this is one of those things, I've been saying this lately to people about the difference between so the law and the spirit, right? So the, the law is, well, we go biblical for a moment, you know, thou shalt not kill, right? That's the law. But the spirit is, you shouldn't even have that angry thought in the first place. So you might as well kill them, right? That question is kind of one of those things. So it's what do we do? What do we choose to do? What do we want to do? So whether or not, we are self-governing. I would say no, but not because of England or America. I would say because of Canada. No, I say because of Canada, because we've given up the airport, the hospital, and electricity, and telecommunications to Canadians. So if, as an example, take, um, so then how many decisions do we make that are impacted at the airport, the hospital, and other things? But we can make a lot of decisions that we just don't bother get involved in. And one of those, I think, I'm not speaking out of turn here, but I am generally nervous about what I'm about to say, is I think Curb may be bringing a campaign later on this year or sometime soon about changing one constitutional issue that might give Bermudians a bit more say, or at least a bit more awareness of the things that happen if you're above our head, because there's a definite plan and procedure that keeps us out, but also keeps us where our interest is. So as long as we're focusing on something down here, we don't bother to look up. And I can tell you, every single government from this one to every, the first one we've had relies on that. And you're talking to somebody who wrote speeches for ministers and premiers and campaigns and election stuff and press releases. I can tell you what's relied on. This is a counteraction to that.
Well, it's fun. It's, it's, you know, well, let me just say, I'll give you an answer for something that happened a year ago or two that made me nervous. The UK and the US just struck an agreement that can, if you will, protect our waters. Okay? That frightens me. So I don't even know what that means. But to answer that particular question, um, I showed you the comment from the Menahedi Hydra about the military impact and the commerce and, and money was the point of Bermuda. The U.S. Civil War, in terms of progress, um, I'm actually I'm, I'm somewhat stalling because I, I still can't believe that this was the case, but it's the truth. So I've said in the past that Bermuda sided with the South in the Civil War, the slave building, slave wanting South, and Bermuda did, and it's very easy to point at, at the sort of powers that be or the government of the time and say, well, of course, look what they were doing to black communities, of course they would side with the southern states. Well, partly. The UK, its cotton mills used southern cotton. The UK turned a half blind eye to Bermuda, because as long as Bermuda was still getting through those blockades and getting southern cotton to Bermuda and that going to England, England was okay. And so we couldn't even side, if you will, with the enslaved in America because, again, above our level, decisions were being made about our social life. And let me tell you, it, well, I will, but I'll just say that a lot of times decisions impact us that have not, and the, and the Big ones and small ones. I'll, I'll go on the record and say, if anybody here is a shareholder of this company, or, or so, so be it. I'm say it to you, come to your company and tell your money. I hate those little blue bikes laying around the country. I think it looks like litter. Okay? But here's the thing there was no national tourism plan that said we should do this. Right? That's a private business. And that private business decision, maybe approved by one minister, means to me, my country is now littered. With bikes that look like they broke down. If it was a national interest, right, then maybe a national interest would say we should have these scooters, but they need to be here or in these kind of holders or at these spots or only at bus stops or whatever. But instead, we don't have so you talk about self governing or what interest runs what. We got mini cars because of America's cop, not because we or our government says, you know what, we shouldn't have tourism up there, we should look for an alternative. And let's see what we can do. No, a foreign event came in. Foreign people had a sponsorship for those cars. They were given permission, and now we're into that business. That's not proactive. That's not governing. That's not leading. That's not nation building. That's just letting people make money who want to make money. Okay. Um, I, like I said, I'm going to get in trouble. Not them. <laughs> I didn't get that tricky. All right. Um, and um, I think that's it. I think it was used to exercise over your time. Uh, so thank you very much for the opportunity. And I will just close this close it off. Amen. Amen. You enjoyed that presentation? Amen. We want to thank uh, Brother Corey uh, Butterfield for um, being so committed. And, and his assistant, what's your name again? Stacy Williams. For coming here, we want to thank uh, Brother Riley as well for, for being present here at B BCL. You know, th this um, presentation was particularly interesting to me uh, because my mom was an old boy, and 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 so now we we, we have of course heard a different story um, of how old boys plank became old boys plank, and and also uh, my family um, came out of Harris's Bay. We don't call it Devil's Hill anymore. You know, our, our, our family came out of Harris's Bay, so these, these presentations have been particularly interesting uh, to me. So we want to thank you. Thank you so very much for, for coming at DCL, Devonshire Church of 